Matthew 11, verses 28, we're going to read verses 28 and 30. It says, I'll be reading from the um, English Standard Version by choice. And it says, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, mm -hmm. and you will find rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Mm -hmm. In this text, Jesus starts off inviting his disciples to partake and rest. He invites them to come unto him. What's interesting about this invitation is that it's not just an invitation for all who were standing around as bystanders. This invitation was for those who were bent out on the field, boots to the ground, spreading the good news, the gospel about Jesus. It's right there in verse 28. Some translations use the word weary, but the original Greek text uses the word kopieo which means to grow weary, to grow tired, or to grow exhausted. Mm -hmm. This word helps us because it puts into context the audience that Jesus is talking to mm -hmm. and why the people that he is talking to are tired. The work that the disciples were tired from was not the same work that they were caught doing when Jesus found them and chose them to be his disciples. The work that these individuals were tired from was the work that they had been called to by the Lord. This helps us as Christians because it is a fact that we do get tired from time to time. Uh -huh. And as a result, we start looking for rest. Amen. We often find, uh, we often don't find rest because the work that has caused us to be tired might not have been assigned by God. Amen. You've been working out in the world for the world and are now looking for rest in the world, and the world has no rest to offer. Wow. But those who are in Christ have a place to go and rest. I wish I had at least one person in the building that could help me to testify that when I was out there, I found myself tired, always weary, Amen. always exhausted. Yes. But since I found Jesus, yes. I found in Jesus a resting place. Yes. Psalms 23 says that he makes me to lie down yes. in green pastures, that he leads me beside the still waters. It is Jesus, it is he who restores my soul. Jesus invites us to rest in him. Amen. How does Jesus offer us rest in him? How can we find rest in Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the first thing that I've seen in the text is his yoke of instruction. Jesus is using this farming analogy to help his disciples understand clearly exactly what Jesus is inviting them to. Yokes are a farming tool still used then and now by farmers. Yokes consist of a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the neck of two animals and attached to a plow or a cart that is then pulled. What's interesting about this ancient farming tool is that it is used with two animals and without two animals the tool is ineffective. Right. Two animals are placed towards the outer parts of the crossbars and whatever is being pulled by the animals are in the middle of the yoke and the weight is shared between both parts. Right. In a sense, Jesus is saying, take my yoke. Yes. He's not inviting them to do no work Come on. He's not promising him. He's not promising them that he would remove the burden from their life. That's not the picture that Jesus is painting at all. Perhaps it's that the load that is connected to the yoke won't be as heavy as the loads they've been forced to pull in the past. Or perhaps it's because the yoke requires two parties in order to be effective. Jesus is offering to carry the load along with us. And I know I'm right about it because I read in his word that he would never leave us nor forsake us. He promised that he would stick closer than any brother. But what exactly is the yoke? The yoke is his word. Let me give you a little context so that you can appreciate the content. During this time, 
the disciples were having to deal with the Pharisees and the requirement of the Jewish leaders. They often had to struggle with the religious um, leaders of the time. The Pharisees, who were the law keepers at that time, mm -hmm. took it upon themselves to ensure that others were keeping the law. Mm -hmm. All 613 of them that they came up with. Mm -hmm. These laws were called sub-laws, if you would. They were created to clarify the Mosaic law, or what we know as the Ten Commandments. Right. For an example, one of the Ten Commandments is to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. The Jewish leaders then created other laws in addition to that one law um, that would help people to keep from breaking the law. One example of that law was how many steps a person could take on the Sabbath. As a consequence, there were webs of rules and regulations that people felt forced to follow because they were being enforced by these religious leaders. Mm -hmm. The issue was that it was all legalism. It was always about following the letter of the law rather than understanding the heart and the intent of the law. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees thought that they could get to God through the law, but that wasn't the case at all. We see this in Matthew chapter 22 when the Pharisees asked Jesus about the law, and Jesus' response was simple. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, yes. with all your soul, and with all your mind, mm -hmm. and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. For those of us who are students of the law, or students of the word, we understand that the Ten Commandments that we are given in the Old Testament can be categorized into these two in the New Testament it that Jesus has presented. It is this understanding that Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand um, as they are going out doing work in the name of the Lord. He's literally asking them not to worry about the pressures of their law, but to take my yoke, my law, and learn from me. Right. For I am gentle yes. and lowly in heart. Yeah. And how great is it to serve a Savior who is gentle and lowly at heart. And when you're living this life out, because we're human, we are bound to make some mistakes. At some point in time, we're going to slip up and stumble. And it's good to know that we have someone exactly. who will be gentle yes. with me. Yes. Someone who won't always deal with me like I deserve to be dealt with. You, I'm yes. grateful tonight for a Savior who is gentle and lowly at heart. Amen. So Jesus invites those who are tired from working to rest. Not only does Jesus give us rest, but Jesus also gives us redemption. Let the whole church say redemption. Redemption. Stay with me. <laughs> uh, let's turn to Romans 8. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, we'll start at verse 1. And just shout amen once you have that. Romans 8, verses 1 through 5, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Mm -hmm. This word condemnation is defined as a damnatory sentence or an adverse verdict. In general terms, it means guilty. Mm -hmm. Paul's writing to the church in Rome helps us to understand that those who are in Christ mm -hmm. have been redeemed from our guilty sentence. Mm -hmm. I must express this now, just in case I missed it in my first point, that this is only for those who are in Christ. 
for those who are in relationship with Christ, yeah. those who are in continuous communion with Christ, those who have habitation and not just visitation. Mm. Wow. In the text, you see the word law again. Good. Here we see two laws being mentioned, mm -hmm. that of the spirit and that of sin and death. Mm -hmm. One law had us bound from judgment. And the other law had to come in and rescue us if we were ever going to have a chance to survive. Oh. And it was done through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It is through Jesus Christ that we pass from death because of sin to life because of Christ. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin mm -hmm. is death, Amen. but the gift of God is eternal life. Psalms 51 and 5 says, I was brought forth with iniquity. Mm -hmm. In sin did my mother conceive me. Most of us hear that as, I was born in sin, shaken in iniquity. Mm -hmm. Sin was not something we could escape. And because of that, hell was inescapable as well. Mm -hmm. As humans, we were infected with a deadly disease called sin. This condition had us en route to hell and enjoying the wrath. But God had a different plan. Thank you, Lord Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son, mm -hmm. that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's all Paul is really trying to say in verses 3 through 5. Everyone who has ever been born is guilty of sin. Mm -hmm. Because sin had entered into the world right. and the law was not enough to save us from ourselves. That's what the law could not do. The law could not erase sin. The law could not forgive sin. The law had boundaries to keep a person from sin. And there were things in place if a person did sin, but the law could never erase wow. the sin. Right. So God had to send his son mm -hmm. to condemn sin and overcome death. Well, how did he do this? Romans 5, 8, and verses 9 mm -hmm. uh, says, But God showed his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Verse 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. In the Old Testament, when, oh, when a person sinned, there had to be a sacrifice made in that, place, in that person's place to cover or take punishment for that sin. Notice I said cover, not cleanse. Come on. If a person committed a sin, the person would have to go get a goat, mm -hmm. a lamb, or a ram and offer it as a sacrifice. The animal had to have certain qualifications mm -hmm. in order to be considered a perfect sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The animal couldn't have any blemishes or imperfections. Mm -hmm. And it had to be the youngest male of the animals you had. This law made sin a burden because sin caused those living to have to use what they would feed their family with wow. to cover their sin. Wow. And it was a must that blood be shed for the remission of sin. And it is this reason that Jesus was considered the perfect sacrifice. Second oh Corinthians 5 verses 21 says, For our sake, he made, he made him to be who knew no sin, mm -hmm. so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus entered into the world, wrapped in our sinful nature, which is flesh. Mm -hmm. And although never committed sin, became sin. Became sin. He suffered the punishment for sin that we should have suffered. And so, and so we became the righteousness of God. All of us who have committed 
has sinned were guilty of sin. On Judgment Day, without Jesus, everyone who would have committed a sin would have been sentenced to hell as a punishment for sin. Legally, if we commit an unlawful violation and are given a fine for breaking that law, a person could pay that fine and the judge would have to let us go. And that is what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross. He has done what the law could not do right. and has cleansed us and washed us from our sins. Amen. Not just the punishment of the sin, but the power of the sin. Mm -hmm. We no longer have to be bound to the powers of sin because of the salvific work of God through Jesus who is the Christ. Christ gives us rest. Christ gives us redemption. And lastly, Christ gives us freedom. Please turn to John 8. John chapter 8, verses 34. And it reads like this. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, mm -hmm. you are free indeed. I'm going to try not to stay here too long. And I'm going to try to do this without getting excited. But this had to be my favorite part of the lesson. In this text, Jesus is having a conversation with Jesus. Jesus uses a picture of slavery to help the Jews understand how slavery is sin. Well, I'm sorry, how sin is slavery. Hopefully by now you understand that because we were born into sin, we were born into slavery. But now it should be clear that we have always been slaves as it relates to sin. This is the picture that Jesus is trying to help the Jews see in John chapter 8. If Romans 3 and 23 is correct, then it is safe to say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, not all have sinned. Not only have all sinned, but if you're not afraid to admit it, we've all sinned and enjoyed sin. Go ahead. Well, uh, and that, my friend, uh -huh. is practicing sin. Uh -huh. <laughs> Romans 6 and 16 says we become a slave to whatever we choose to obey. Wow. And verse 34 says that anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Wow. So we were all enslaved oh, to so sin. Good. Jesus goes on in verse 35 to explain the contrast between the slave and the son, starting with the slave. The slave does not stay in the house forever. Jesus was referring to the Jews and how they dealt with slaves. Mm -hmm. A Jewish slave was only supposed to remain a slave for six years and was to be released from the house after the seventh year. I'll say it again. A Jewish slave was only supposed to remain a slave for six years and be released from the house after the seventh year. Uh -huh. This was uh, very different from Jesus' explanation of the son. The son remained in the house forever. This comparison shows us that membership by birth was more superior than membership by obligation. Mm -hmm. The slave was just there to work. The slave was just there to fulfill a role. The slave wasn't of much value to the family if the slave could not work. Wow. If the owner was done with the slave, the owner could just go and do with the slave what the owner pleased. Mm, you're doing real good. This is why it's important to choose 
what you choose to obey. All right. Because what after whatever <laughs> it is is done with you, it gets to choose what it does with you. The slave doesn't stop being the slave after the seventh year. The slave just goes on to being someone else's slave for another period of time. And unless free, the cycle continues. But the relationship between the son that is described in the text, like I said, differs from the slave. In verse 36, it says that the son remains in the house forever. The son is biologically the father's. Mm -hmm. right. What belongs to the father uh -huh. belongs to the son. Uh -huh. The son has luxuries that can be explored because he's the son. He can go and get what he wants uh -huh. because he is the son. Uh -huh. He can go and do what he wants to do because he is the son. Yeah. Everything in the house and everything yeah. around the house yeah. that belongs to the father inevitably belongs to the son. Wow. Because he is the son, he can technically call okay. shots that no one else would be able to call. On, the Dad. son carries the same name as the father, All right. the same blood as the father, and holds the same authority as the father. The son would be the one in charge if the father was absent. Wow. This is made true because biological membership trumps membership by obligation. Okay. So although the slave will leave, the son has to leave. I'm sorry. So although the slave will leave, uh -huh. the son never has to leave because of the relationship that the son has with the father. Wow. For those of us who were former yes, slaves, this is good news. Uh -huh. For those of us who are still, for those of you who are still enslaved, this is still good news. All right. The last verse says that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Yes. I said this is good news because it confirms what we just discovered in the verse, that the Son has the power to free the enslaved. Wow. Not just to replace the slave. That's not what yes. we're talking about. Not just relinquishing the slave of the duties at that particular house. That's not what we're talking about. Because the slave is property of the father, mm. the slave is property of the son. Yeah. And because the son has the same authority mm -hmm. as the father, if the son sets the slave free, I'll say it again, the slave is free not only from the duties, but from the bondage of slavery. Okay. If you haven't noticed it by now, I'll go ahead and give it to you. If you look at the printed scripture in your Bible, uh -huh. or look at it on your Bible app, okay. you will see that the word son is capitalized. Right. When Jesus is uh -huh. explaining this reality to the Jews, Jesus is talking about himself. Uh -huh. Jesus, who is directly connected to the Father, has been given the authority yes. of the Father, yes. and because of that, has the authority to set you free. Matthew 28 and 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Yes. This authority was given from the Father in an effort to set us all free. Mm -hmm. And not just free, but free indeed. Yeah. This word indeed, and this is where I'll end, this word indeed means through and through. And I'm finished with this lesson, but I just had to end with a testimony yes. that when Jesus frees, he does it just like that, through and through. When he delivered me, he delivered me through and through. When he healed me, he healed me through and through. When he changed me, he changed me through and through. And it's just like the song says, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. Thank you.
I studied the word. I studied. Yes. Amen. And did it like, y'all, like in like 25 minutes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I got to give God. I, I, I don't clap everything. Yes. I have to clap because, because of several different reasons. Because everything that I said before he got up, amen, is why I have to clap and give God a hand praise for this minister, amen. amen. Praise God as we, we know that what we're doing here, our minister line staff, y'all, and I introduced back then, I said, he's on his way, he's on his way, <laughs> amen, to the minister line fully, praise God for what we do here, amen, and, and so minister there, thank you for studying, thank, thank you for putting and laboring. How many of you know he labored for that word? Amen. He labored for that word. Amen. Like, like he's been preaching like 10 years. Like he labored that word. Amen. And for that, we tell the Lord, thank you. Amen. Because God has blessed us, thanks to God. God has blessed us with some ministers here, evangelists, uh, elder, amen, <laughs> just, uh, uh, teachers, amen. And I'm excited. That's the reason why I yield. I know everybody ain't doing this. I know they're not. They teach you every single, single Wednesday. I yield a Wednesday because I want you to hear from the gifts that God has placed in this church. Amen. We are blessed. Hallelujah. You want to run the blessing here. We want you to know it, and we're glad you're here to be able to hear and partake of the word of the Lord on tonight. We are blessed. Yes, we are. We are blessed in this church. God Amen. has blessed us. We got some preaching here. Like I said, evangelists and teachers and Lord have mercy, ministers and elders, and we just, we're just blessed. Thank you, Lord. And I thank the Lord, amen, for each and every last, I'm saying that out loud right now, again, amen, for each and every last one of you all. And I, I, I yield my Wednesday, amen, and every other Wednesday. Matter of fact, I ain't talk for a couple of Wednesdays, amen, but guess what, I'm all right with that, y'all. Amen. amen, because we have a minister alive staff here, and for y'all that don't know, we have seven licensed ministers amen. here, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. They live right. Hello, somebody. Amen. Everybody, people say something, but are you living right? Amen. Amen. And they live right. Praise God. I can trust them at the altar to work the altar to lay clean hands. Hallelujah. While they pray for people. Amen. Amen. So we thank you, praise the Lord, again for the word of the Lord on tonight. Amen. Uh, y'all know I take notes. So I got my notes, but, but then, then because I was taking notes and then I missed something, I said, I'm so glad this is live because tonight I'm going to be going back and I missed a couple of scriptures. And I was like, what did he just say? Okay, and then it all linked up. Yeah, that was good. That was good. So I got to go back. Praise God. Just pick up those scriptures. Amen. Make sure that I have them. Amen. And again, we bless the Lord. Amen. For the word of the Lord on tonight. Thank you. Praise God. Each and every last one of you who pressed your way to Frankfurt. Amen. Even for you, Mr. Matthew, who didn't have to drive. I know. Gosh. All right. <laughs> Amen. Brother Matthew, who did not have to drive too far. But I don't care. That's still a sacrifice. Anytime. Amen. I know we need to be glad to come into God's house. But it's also a sacrifice when you work all day. And you get up at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock. Some of us get up at 4, amen, and we press our way to get in God's house. And for that, we tell the Lord, thank you. Amen. For the press, for those who are on, amen, on uh, the worship live stream, we want you to know that we thank God for you because Ambassador Christ Ministries is alive. We know that if you could be here tonight, we know that you would be here, amen. Praise God. Some of you all know me and I work to 7 o'clock, but you're on. Praise God, and I'm glad that you're on. Amen. So if you are one of those tonight, praise God, who uh, give your tithing offering on Wednesday night, if that is you, uh, just come up and just do it. Amen. Just 